Thank you so much for tuning into the show and welcome to season two of the Audiobook Club with John York. The Audiobook Club, partnered with Pro Audio Voices, celebrates audiobooks, the amazing people and teams who make them happen, as well as the various talents behind storytelling. To learn more about Amplify and other opportunities to grow your sales, platform and audience, head over to ProAudioVoices.com and listen out for a short but informational advertisement within this episode. Let's start the show. Hello and welcome to the Audiobook Club. In this week's episode, we're so lucky to be joined by actor and audiobook narrator Alexa Elmi. Alexa, it's such a joy to have you on the show. How are you today? Good. I'm so excited to be here. I'm very excited to have you here. So like, big question to start off with. How's things at the moment? How's everything going with you? Um, it's been pretty chaotic. I feel like every time I think work is getting a little slow, I'm suddenly flooded with projects, which is a great problem to have. I really can't complain about that. But I found out last week that my play is going to premiere at United Solo Festival in New York City in the fall, which I think I'm still processing that news, honestly. For those who don't know, United Solo Festival is this really cool New York City theater festival. And it's also the largest festival for solo performance in the world. So the fact that my play is going to be in it is kind of a dream come true. So yeah, I've kind of been taking that information in and starting to make my plan for, okay, how am I going to accomplish everything? But it's okay, because I have all summer. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> but that is amazing. Well, first of all, congratulations on that. That is an Thank you. insane achievement. Um, Alexa Play, um, and apologies to any listeners who have just set off their devices by saying that. Um, I know, right? <laughs> <laughs> I, I'd really love to know like, how this came about. Could you tell us a little bit more about the play, You know, where the idea came from, how you found that process of producing it, just like your overall experience doing it? Because it is incredible. Well, I'll tell you the log line first, just okay. so everyone knows what we're talking about. Um, The logline is a young woman named Alexa, fed up with Amazon's bastardization of her name, starts a support group for real Alexas to commiserate over the robot that stole their identity and to take on yet another mega conglomerate hell-bent on turning women into objects. So So it's a feminist piece. It's as someone named Alexa, I will just be upfront and say this is inspired by my real life um you know i i am often meeting new people and one of the first things they say is oh my god your name is alexa and then they proceed to tell me an alexa joke yeah which i could do without i'm gonna be (laughs) honest so i guess some of it uh the inspiration is some pent-up rage so i'm not (laughs) <laughs> um, but yeah, it's it's a feminist piece of theater and um it deals with topics of capitalism and the misogyny that you know is really rooted in our society that we kind of like to pretend is not there, but I think it's mm. important to take a look at it um yeah. and ask ourselves why do we just allow this to continue it does not Mm. have to be this way um so yeah oh and it's a comedy obviously so like did you so you say that it came from obviously that real life experiences and and that frustration so did that you had that in there and you wanted to am i got this right that you wanted to do something with that idea and then like how did the idea to form it into a play came about or was it i want to write a play oh this is something that means something to me i should do about this like which like kind of what order did it come about in The thing about playwriting for me is that it's really one of the only art forms that I participate in that is just for me. Mm -hmm. And so I think, um, and I had started doing solo performance. I took a class on it in college. And from that, I started realizing, oh, I can create my own art. This is amazing. I'm going to keep doing this. Yeah. Um, And so then I got more into playwriting. The idea for this play, I originally actually wrote it as a full play with many other characters, and then I realized it just wasn't working Mm. in that format, and I think because I'm an actor, my 
writing style really stems from performance. So a lot mm. of it, you know, I'm walking around with a notepad and and saying things aloud before I put pen to paper even. Mm -hmm. um, and so it, it just was working much better as a solo performance. It's, it's really fantastic. I mean, like performing in like a, a one woman show and then, of course, narrating audiobooks, which we'll get into in just a moment. Do you work better like in solitude then? <laughs> Does that seem to jive with you? Like, <laughs> You know, based on that description, you'd really think so. <laughs> I actually would say no. Given okay. that my roots are in the theater, I really love collaboration. Yeah. And um, I often actually say that doing dual narration projects are always my favorite because I think it's so fun getting to collaborate with mm -hmm. other narrators and develop these character voices and all of that stuff. Mm -hmm. um, and that very much goes back to theater and the collaboration there. So yes, I work well alone, <laughs> but for my show, yeah. although I'm the one that is wrote it and will be performing it, you know, I'll have a director, I'll have a mm -hmm. team with me. So it's not just me putting it up. That would be, I think I would lose my mind. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Something that, again, another parallel between audiobook narration and performing on stage, of course, you know, acting in audiobooks. But there isn't that adrenaline there most of the time, because obviously it's not live. You, you know, you, you're, you're in that sort of safe space of recording, whereas on the stage you're performing live the adrenaline's there you've got the audience interaction like do, is it like is it f fair to ask you which which one you prefer or is there like you know sections of each element of performance that you enjoy i think there are sections of each that i enjoy i would say in terms of the adrenaline mm. there's no feeling better than getting off stage and having that energy still coursing through your body yeah but I think the intimate feel of audiobooks, I really love that. And I really yeah. love that I, you know, get to voice all the characters. And um, in my training as an actor, I mm -hmm. always really loved the vocal aspect of the craft. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, those course, the voice courses and dialect and all that were always my favorite classes which mm -hmm. my mom actually was a speech language pathologist. Oh, cool. So I feel like that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. So the vocal aspect was always my favorite. And so after studying acting at Fordham, um, I ended up still having this desire in the back of my mind to do voiceover work. And it was really mm. through the voiceover work that I found audiobook narration. Mm. Okay. And once that's I started, I just couldn't stop. Yeah, that's also well. I want to ask you all about that. Going back to your to you know your, your studying your education, was was acting always a thing on the cards? Was that the only thing you wanted to do, or was there other things roaming around that you fancied? So, I always really loved acting. Um, in fact, as I was thinking about. As I was preparing for this podcast and thinking about, okay, what's he going to ask me and what should I be prepared <laughs> to answer, I recalled this story from, I was in fourth grade, and we did this play, which I think maybe the teachers even wrote this play, so I couldn't even tell you what it was called. Okay. But I got to faint on stage, and it was the best thing ever. It was this big dramatic moment, and I loved it. And I think it was at that moment that I decided I wanted to be an actor. <laughs> and then, of course, uh, when I was in high school, I spent two summers studying at Stella Adler. Yeah. And that was where I realized, oh, not only can I do this as a career, I'm going to. That's really cool. So you had that like drive that, that really solidified it for you. And then you were like, I'm going to give this one. Yeah, yeah. definitely. Yeah. That's um, really but I've cool. always been deeply invested in the arts and um in fact like i grew up going uh to an art class on saturdays every morning um it was like doing like painting and drawing and all of that stuff so if i wasn't acting i would still be doing art yeah you know? still telling stories yeah yeah that's really cool so you mentioned a little bit about how you discovered 
audiobooks through like voiceover. Could you maybe elaborate a little bit more? Like, how did you, like, how did you take those first steps? What were that, those first steps into audiobook narration like for you? Um, so I had taken this course actually through Stella Adler that was about voiceover work and every lesson was a different medium within the voiceover mm. world. And one of those sections was audiobooks. Mm. Um, so that probably was my introduction. And after that, I started co doing coaching and all of that. Mm -hmm. um, the first book that I narrated, though, I actually was performing in a show at the time. So it was kind of a a slow start there. Yeah, yeah. But it's really only like the last three years, I would say, that, which is kind of a long time, actually, <laughs> um, the last three years that I've looked at it more as a profession. What was the, in those early days, what was like the biggest obstacle that you had to overcome being an audio narrator? It could be something like practical about narrating. It could be, you know, in the mental space of side of it. Is there anything that comes to mind as, a, as an obstacle of which you had to overcome? I think it was the technical aspect of everything. Mm -hmm. It was actually figuring out how to set up my booth and um, learning um, how to use the audio software and all of that, mm -hmm. which taking the time to learn those skills was really important. And I would say that once I got that stuff under my belt, I suddenly was booking a lot more work and, you, you know, yeah. everything, the wheels started to really roll. Yeah. Um, but during the pandemic, actually, um, my voiceover agent had said, you need to upgrade your mic. You need to upgrade your studio or you can't audition, Okay, which was a little bit scary at the time because I didn't really know what I was doing yeah but um yeah that was honestly the best thing that could have happened to me <laughs> yeah we saw the learning curve isn't it it's, it is um, it definitely yeah. is I was exactly the same <laughs> yeah it's like what was it do you think about like audiobooks as like a medium that drew you into a performer like, like, like what was it about audiobooks that you, you were narrating something and you thought hang on a second this is like this may be like something that I can really take seriously. Um, I think it was the storytelling aspect of it. I also mm. think, I think it's so cool that you get to spend this short amount of time with these stories and then move on to the next one. Mm -hmm. Um, and especially when I was having lulls within my stage and film acting, mm -hmm. it was so nice to have audiobooks. Mm -hmm. Um, and I feel like, yeah, it kind of kept me on my toes. I like to say actually that because I narrate audiobooks, when I get copy for an audition or whatever, yeah, um, I'm much better at cold reading than people who aren't reading every day. Do you know, that's so interesting that you said that. I've done like 60 odd episodes of this show so far. And no one's mentioned that, but that's something that I've noticed in my own life. Like reading through, like I was at a read through a rehearsal a few months ago and I was asked to read all the stage directions. So I was just helping out this other little group and stuff. And I'm like, I, if I say so myself, killed it. <laughs> like, I, was, <laughs> and I, was I like, bet you did. <laughs> and it was like, do you know what? That's such like a nice thing to you. You do become like a, a better reader. I know that sounds obvious, but I didn't, I didn't realize that until it happened. <laughs> Yeah, no, it's it's really true though. Um I would say I I also love audiobooks in terms of like I get to work on so many different genres. Yeah. And I feel like sometimes acting wise, you know, I look a certain way, so I get cast in roles that are really specific and sometimes it feels mm -hmm. very narrow, but I I don't feel that way about audiobooks. I think mm -hmm. it's so fun that I get to go from a fantasy to a romance to a YA book. Um, yeah. And so it's it's just fun to dive into all these different worlds. Definitely. Are there any sort of like any particular genres that maybe you'd like to perform more than you do, you're doing at the moment? Or maybe even genres that you, you haven't performed yet that you'd like to in the future? Um, 
I would say I would love to do more mystery. Mm -hmm. I would love to do, I actually just narrated a psychological thriller. Cool. And that was really cool because that was the first one that I've done. Um, I'd also like to do more nonfiction. I feel like mm -hmm. I could be really good at memoirs, like a good, fun, contemporary memoir for like, yeah. 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 Something like that would be fun. So you mentioned like, um, you know, you're not necessarily as sort of like fenced in with options in audiobooks because, you know, the world's your oyster. Are there any particular sort of traits of a character that you love to perform in, in uh, you know, in audiobooks? So it's like certain traits that it doesn't necessarily matter what genre it is, but certain traits of either a main character or a character with a fair few lines that pop up and you think, oh, this is this is going to be fun to do. Um, Yes, I would say that I love a feisty heroine in control yeah. of her own destiny especially if she's wearing designer high heels is what <laughs> I would say <laughs> um I love yeah because I feel like there's nothing better than this is a little bit different but a sweet girl next door with a rebellious streak you know because yeah I think that just like in real life you have you I get a lot of characters that you know, they seem really sweet and innocent, but they're not. There is that underbelly there that mm. you have to pay attention to. And mm. so I think that those characters that have those sharp edges can be really fun. Yeah, definitely. Do you find like any elements of recording kind of like therapeutic? Like if there's like, because there's sometimes like I've gone into the booth and I've recorded like a big row, right? So I'm having a big argument all to myself, all like, you know, through between three different characters. And I record at like eight o'clock in the morning. So I'll, I'll come out and I'll feel so refreshed. <laughs> <laughs> um, Definitely. I Every time you hear me cry, you hear what sounds like I'm crying. Yeah. I'm really in my booth crying. Really? Uh, yep. Yep. Every time. And I actually... Um, so that part of it, I definitely find therapeutic, although I also, after a session like that, I kind of have to, um, do something to shake it off because it, yeah. I do feel like sometimes you kind of get stuck in that, oh, I just had this big fight with this character and now I'm going to be mad, um, yeah. for the rest of my day. Like, I can't go on living my life like that. So I feel like sometimes I'll listen to music or or do something fun afterwards just to kind of reset mm -hmm. which i think is important and i think that's important for acting as a whole yeah i think how is your work life balance like like at the moment or like in general like are you good at sort of taking breaks and stuff is that being like a journey for you because sometimes like especially when you know you're self-employed and you're responsible for the work that's coming in it can often feel like a pressure of you have to be doing something all the time you have to be at least you know reaching out to people you have to be attending these events and stuff like how are you like right now at being able to sort of switch off and think you know enough's enough i'm gonna have the weekend off i'm trying to get better at it <laughs> if i'm being honest I definitely do feel like I have to be working 24-7. Hmm. And even if I have a bunch of projects lined up, I'm always trying to think about, okay, but what about after that? Being self-employed, it can be very, that part of it can be very tricky. But I, I would say I'm I'm getting better at it. I'm getting better. I think I'm better in the summer at it because I'm like, oh, it's so nice out. I want to go outside. Yeah. I want to go see my friends. Yeah, I feel that. I'm exactly the same. Like, if to be <laughs> honest, I'm terrible uh, when it's like, it's right, today, the day of recording, it's a gorgeous day outside. And all day I've just kind of been petering out of the window going, should I just sack <laughs> off a load of stuff to do and just go for a nice walk? <laughs> <laughs> yeah totally performing um performing on stage staying in character for you know the entire show especially with this just you on the stage and then of course with narrating audiobooks as well like does taking on these long form projects projects that allows you to stay with a character or a set of characters for a good length of time does that does that like help you as a performer as opposed to you know a short film or tv or film where it, you know you can just be you know it could be a really short scene where you have to keep stopping and resetting that kind of thing does it does these long form um mediums help in a, as as a performer um i am not sure if i would say that they help mm -hmm. but i would say that 
I enjoy them more. I enjoy mm. digging into the character work mm. a lot. Um, and all my acting training has really come in handy in terms of that stuff for audiobook characters. Mm -hmm. um, but I would say all of those short projects where you where you're resetting scenes and all of that has helped with the smaller characters as well mm. i think as an actor you have to often generate those backstories for yourself with um that character that has one line or whatever it is mm -hmm. so i think you know it's it kind of goes back and forth i think mm -hmm. they help each other if yeah, that get, makes sense. Maybe yeah, that makes, didn't make any sense. No, that made perfect sense. I get you completely. When when creating characters, either for a voice of an audiobook or even, you know, writing, you know, to put in a play or uh, write, writing just for general, like when, do, like, do you draw upon like your real experiences, real people that you've met? Do you like, are you out and about living your life and then you'll see like a quirky character and you think you're going in my next play? Like, is, it, is that how your sort of brain works? <laughs> that... Oh my gosh, sometimes. Sometimes there are just people you meet who, you know, I'll get a scene or I'll get a new book and I'll think, oh my gosh, this reminds me of such and such person. Yeah. So yes, that definitely happens. <laughs> Although, but I think that, that's good because I try to think about every character as being a real person. And I think yeah. that for the listener, it's really important that the actor does that. Yeah. Um, you know, for audiobooks in particular, I begin with how the character is described in the text, of mm -hmm. course. If I'm working independently with an author, I like to uh I'll give them this small packet, which basically has my process, as well as a few questions about the characters and the story itself. For example, did they have a celebrity in mind as they were writing mm. the book? Because they often have had one in mind. Um, mm. Sometimes they've got the project fully cast in their head, which is so fun. Yeah. Um, and so using all of that, I'll, I'll think about their personality and their qualities and Using all that information that I've gathered, I imagine how their voice might sound. Mm -hmm. Usually that part of it, I mean, sometimes I'm thinking about a real person, especially for dialect work. I find that very helpful. But yeah, usually I, I'm able to take all these things that I know about the character or that I've, you know, some of it maybe I've added to their backstory or whatever. Yeah. And then I kind of think about what their voice might sound like, and then I vocalize it. Yeah. And sometimes I have to make adjustments afterward, but I definitely, I like to plan out all my character voices in advance. Like, how long do you give yourself to, like, prep a, you know, I know every book will be different in some way, but, like, just a, as a general rule, how long are you giving yourself to have a play around with those voices and characters? It depends. Um, sometimes I'm able to spend more time than others. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I have to spend more time, especially when care when if a book has a ton of characters, I sometimes that can be a little time consuming. Um, but yeah, I, I like to spend a week reading and thinking about the characters and all of that, and then another week actually narrating. Yeah. If I can, but I don't always yeah. have that luxury. Again, obviously different, so it's not going to be like a, a steadfast answer. But like, do you sort of set out your per finished hours? Like, do you like say, I'm going to do like one per finished hour per working day? Or is it just sort of depend on how you feel? Does it depend on like sort of the length of the project? Like, can you sort of just like sort of chat us through that your process of recording? I think it depends on the length of the project, but I would say... I typically get two finished hours done mm -hmm. um, in a day. There have been times where I've done, I would say, up to three, and I don't necessarily recommend that because <laughs> it can be a lot. Yeah. But, you know, I do my vocal warm-ups before I start recording, and I think it's really important that I do that because, you know, you have to protect your voice and all of that. Yeah. And if I wasn't doing those warm ups, you definitely couldn't get three finished hours done. Um, I would say two is about what I do. 
Yeah. Two is what I do happily. That's fair. So, like, how do you sort of, like, structure your day? Like, could you sort of maybe walk us through, like, a typical day in the working life of Alexa? Um, It depends. And I feel like it changes. But I like to start my mornings answering all the emails mm -hmm. um, that I have to answer. And then I'll do my warm-ups. I'll get in the booth. I'll remind myself of the characters and all that. I like to read a few pages before I start recording out loud just to remind myself of the writing style and all of that. Um, and I like to, I think it's important for me to remind myself also, okay, what is the kind of story that I'm telling? Is it a love story? Is it a murder mystery? Etc. cetera, mm. because I do feel like that informs the way that you're telling the story. Um, and then I begin narrating. Sounds pretty good to me. And then, you know, sometimes, <laughs> like, when I get tired, I'll start prepping other books and all of that. Do you find it easy to go in between, like, say, if you're recording, like, you know, a specific project, you're prepping the one for the next week, do you find it quite easy to flip between the two projects in your head, especially if they're, like, vastly different? I do. And I think I, that's only because I take a lot of notes. I usually mm. have um, a spreadsheet that I'm filling out as I'm reading just so that I can refer back to it. Mm. Um, and what I left out of uh, my what I do every day is I usually try to do any um, voiceover work. I do corporate narration as well, and I do... Sometimes I do commercial voiceover work. I try to do all that stuff in the morning because mm -hmm. it's that I would say is totally different from narrating audiobooks. Often the sound is much brighter. Sometimes it's it's more high energy at times. Yeah. Although, I mean, narrating audiobooks also can be very, very high energy, but it's just totally different. So I try to yeah. knock out any work like that in the morning before I start my long form sessions. Yeah, I think that's a, I think that's a great way of going about it, to be honest. Um, we met at APAC, of course, um, and I had the blast meeting you and hanging out with our little circle and stuff. It was it was so much fun. Um, I'd love to know kind of your thoughts around networking in general. Like, you know, it's so important in this line of work. Like, do, does that come easy to you? Has it been a work in progress getting out there to those events? Um, so that was my first time at APAC, which yeah. that first at the pre-APAC social, I thought, oh my gosh, this is, because it there was just so many people in that room and it was so loud. So I was a little nervous after that about what the conference was going to be like. However, I didn't need to be nervous because it was totally fine and much more of a normal volume the next day. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Um, and I was actually so happy that we had met that first night because it was kind of nice to have someone to say, oh, and there's John. <laughs> you know, if I'm if I am not enjoying talking to such and such person, <laughs> I don't know if I should tell this story. <laughs> but so the first night we were at the social and we were kind of going around talking to people and there was a man that spit food on my shoulder and I really wanted to get away from him because that was really gross. Um, so I was really happy that I had someone kind of with me both to witness that moment, but also to help me find my escape. <laughs> yeah. you, know, you never know at these things who you're going to meet. Sometimes you meet people who accidentally spit on you and yeah. you just have to kind of roll with it. <laughs> <laughs> I think also like acknowledging it as like sort of not as soon as it happened in front of the person, but then also having a bit of a laugh about it makes it sort of a lot like better as well because you can just Absolutely. sort of get over it. Yeah, like I was um on on that same evening, I accidentally elbowed the lady in the face um, oh just God. as she was just she was walking by. It wasn't hard, but it was enough for her to notice. And of course, I said, "Oh my gosh, I'm so sorry." And she just kind of looked. She didn't look that pleased, to be honest, um, which is fair. And, and she went off, and <laughs> I sat, and I went up to um, a, a group of people I was chatting with, and uh, they were all talking about their their uh, social faux pas, which immediately put me at ease. 
So I think being like honest and open about things like that makes you feel so much better about whatever happened, you know, because there's such like high stress environments. Oh, there certainly can be, you know, not that not that this is, you know, specifically one, but, you know, those sort of events can be so overwhelming and uncomfortable sometimes because everyone's trying to be their best selves and all that kind of stuff. So I think it's nice to, you know, to to make sure you inject it with a bit of fun as well. I think also having done a lot of auditions for stage and film not as much in person anymore with since the pandemic but you know I used to do a lot of in-person auditions and that that experience I think has really been helpful in these networking settings because Mm. oh I can just make conversation easily and you know what I've done this a million times and it's going to be fine yeah because I think sometimes in in my head I build it up as this Oh, like, what am I going to say? What are we going to talk about? But then I get there and it's so easy and totally fine. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. And especially at APAC, everyone was just so nice. Hmm. Um, I was happy that I went this past year when I had more experience under my belt. I thought that that was very helpful because it just, you know, gives you more things that you can talk about and more things you can connect with other narrators about. Hmm um yeah yeah definitely have you any advice for those listeners who who you know are really trying to up their networking game perhaps even considering going to APAC I'm not sure if it's online or um, next year or something but you know or some kind of APAC type event like who are looking to you know bring their networking game to the next level have you got kind of any advice for those how they should approach those events I know it might sound difficult but just try to be yourself. Try mm. to remind yourself that everyone there is a little bit nervous, usually. Mm. Be nice to people and they'll be nice to you. Yeah, I, I think that's yeah. really the main point is is that if you're putting your best foot forward and you're trying, people see that. And yeah. Yeah. Like how, so another type of, another end of networking as well is, of course, the online side, having like a social media persona and making sure that everybody in existence knows what you're up to and all of that sort of stuff like how are you with that side of things like I know you have social media accounts of course but like how are you like how do you feel towards documenting your journey online which which we're told to do of course rigorously so I think prior to the pandemic I enjoyed it more (laughs) um and then it kind of felt like something I was forced to be doing yeah However, at APAC, you know, a lot of people were talking about their TikTok accounts and all of that stuff. And yeah, I, I'm very good about Instagram um, just because I find that a lot of the authors that I work with, they'll look up my Instagram and they'll have mm-hmm. accounts and all of that stuff. So they want that interaction. Um since APAC, where every where we were talking about TikTok and all of that, I've been trying to make videos every week. Mm-hmm. And initially, I was kind of stressing about it and thinking, oh, what, what do I have to say to people that's not already out there? Yeah. But more recently, I've been trying to just make fun content that's audiobook related. And that aspect of it allowing myself to be creative yeah within the medium is definitely helping and now i'm now i'm actually kind of having fun with it uh, so well tiktok's like one of those things that's really exploded for narrators hasn't it it's like seems to be like the new place to be i think like since twitter sort of is doing whatever the hell it's doing i think like um <laughs> you know tiktok has been like you know it's really booming for narrators and i was going to sort of ask you you know you see you see narrators doing like sort of live streams, doing all sorts of different stuff. Is that like somewhere where you're going to focus more attention on the future or are you just sort of seeing how it goes, um, you know, seeing what you enjoy doing and that kind of thing? I have thought about the live streaming. I don't necessarily think I want to do that right mm-hmm. now. Um, And maybe in part it's because, you know, you see people go on instagram live all the time and if you ever open instagram accidentally when you've gotten one of those notifications on your phone and they're they're like oh my god i'm the only one on this live stream and now i have to exit it and this is so awkward (laughs) i don't know if you have any 
friends that, you know, for a while I had a friend who would like live stream his yoga session and there was nobody watching. And I, yeah, I, yeah. Yeah. So I, I don't know. I think the idea of live streaming my narration sessions, uh, I feel like it kind of loses the intimacy of narrating. However, Mm -hmm. it would certainly put me more in performance mode. Mm. But I think narrating, I'm in that anyway. So I don't know. I've thought about it. We'll see what happens. For now, I'm just making fun audiobook videos. (laughs) Yeah. And that's enough. Yeah. Because I think that it can easily take over your life, and I don't want it to become... A stressful thing i want it to just be something i'm doing casually that i'm yeah. enjoying oh yeah definitely like if i get like more than five likes in a video i'm running around the house going i'm a star i'm a star <laughs> like, <laughs> 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 definitely I could, I could definitely be succumbed uh, to, <laughs> i could definitely succumb to that sort of mindset i think um but like yeah that's interesting what you said about the live stream and stuff and i'm not it's of, of course not saying anything negative about anyone who does it i think they're amazing if you know whatever works for them but i think like me personally i think that i would be too bothered about how i look in the camera like you, you know to to really get into the t- and also like i don't even want to know what my faces are doing when i'm doing in those characters and then to have oh my gosh you yeah. know all four of my followers watching it's um, you know <laughs> I think or feels... like I don't want people to see me stumbling over words a million times <laughs> or all that kind of stuff. I want yeah. that to just happen privately and then I move on. I'm more interested. I'd I'd be more interested to do one over like prep, although I feel like it's pure procrastination because you've like because because I it, I mean it takes it takes the strength of 10 horses to get me to do prep anyway because I find it like, like you know the most difficult thing to you know concentrate especially when it's like the end of the day and all that kind of stuff so I feel like if you know I think that's more because it, it allows you like more of a of um a way to to chat with people if they had any questions and stuff where you can talk through your own process but yeah I do think I just end up just totally blowing it off and, and, and <laughs> chatting about random stuff yeah <laughs> Yeah, I think I think me as well. I think that's why I'm more focused on the the new idea and then thinking about okay, how am I going to do this? Yeah, yeah, definitely. There's a really lovely quote on your Instagram bio, um, and it's a quote from uh, uh, Pablo uh, Pablo. Jeez, I can't see his name. Pablo <laughs> C- C- Picasso. Um, <laughs> Picasso. <laughs> Picasso. <laughs> Um, and, uh, I'll, I'll say the quote just in case um, uh, the listeners want to know what it is. And it's art washes away from the soul, the dust of everyday life. Um, and not to put you on the spot or anything, but could you like, I, I just wonder if you wanted to like, speak a little bit about that, of why you were, you know, sort of drawn to that quote, because I think it's lovely. I really love that quote. I think that, I think it's the same reason that I really like comedy both mm. in terms of the work that I do as well as the content I'm taking in. Mm. I think life can be really hard sometimes, and it's so nice to be able to lose yourself in mm. your art or in watching other people's art. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I really love that quote. That's so... Mm. I like that you noticed that. <laughs> There's also um, a Stella Adler quote that I really love, and I'm absolutely going to butcher it right now (laughs) but it's um something about growth as a human being is synonymous with growth as an actor and i feel like i really try to live my life by that quote Mm. and for me it's it's kind of about constantly learning new things whether that's you know i i learn a lot narrating audiobooks sometimes Mm. it's just a new word sometimes it's Yeah, when I do my corporate narration, I learn things about the business world that I probably would never know, would never need to know, but that's okay. (laughs) Um, And so I I think that as actors, as performers, it's important to constantly be trying to grow and Mm. what can I do to be a better person and all of that. And I I think it's important for people in general to, to try to think about life that way. Definitely. I think also, also like travel and stuff can can definitely be implemented in that sort of sentiment because like these, I think we can all get very comfortable 
um, in our own little bubbles, you know, with the, with the seeing the same set of people and, and having those same experiences. And then when you get a chance to go abroad and then you see like how other people live and it's completely different to you, it's so nourishing and so exciting. And I think that you you return back to your hometown, your home city or whatever, a completely different person because you've had these experiences and that's something that you can bring to your art. And I, yeah, Absolutely. I love that. Absolutely. Absolutely. And especially going back to the Picasso quote, I often find when I'm getting burnt out with my art or with work or whatever it is, I really mm. love going to museums mm. and I really love or the theater or taking in some kind of art and culture and all that stuff. Yeah. Um, and I find that when I come home, I'm often... S- usually just so refreshed by it and yeah. so inspired to continue creating and whether that's creating a new audiobook or or write a play or whatever it is yeah yeah absolutely i think because like, you speak about um, museums and then you also in new york of course where you're based you have amazing like art galleries as well like, um, i went to the um when i was there not this time last time but the time before that i went to the museum of modern art um, which is my favorite now my favorite gallery of all time because I thought there's something that that because always I go to look at the, the the paintings the pictures and all, everything on the walls and stuff but something hit me while I was walking around there and it was that I because I loved going to see the artwork but what I loved more was watching people's reactions to the artwork because you have the like the obvious people of like contemplation and stuff and like oh yeah look that's cool to see a, a Van Gogh or you know that's really cool and stuff but then like you have like the people who are totally unimpressed, the people who have been dragged <laughs> around there because it's like on the top 10 things to do in New York. And like, <laughs> that is so much more exciting and fulfilling for me to watch <laughs> than anything than that. And I've brought so much of that energy of like, of these places of going to like, it's the same with like APAC as well. Um, mm-hmm. Is that the people that you meet are so much more interesting than the topics that you're kind of learning. Um, if that you're makes sense. You're such an actor. Do you think? <laughs> yes, absolutely. Because I mean, as an actor, you're you're constantly studying people, and and that's exactly what you're describing. <laughs> like, I I just find it really fascinating. Cause I was I wrote a travel diary, um, which uh, I wanted over the time of New York, which I wanted to do something with, but I thought like I always try and be like super honest and stuff, and then obviously because if you come into contact with people and so and I just thought that's it's just gonna sound like I'm being <laughs> like a dick, <laughs> like. <laughs> You know. It's so funny. It's so funny too because New York can be very overwhelming yeah. for people. Um, which I love it. I love the the pace, and I love that it's just there's constantly new things to do and see and all of that. Um, yeah. but yeah, I would be interested to read your uh, travel diary. <laughs> <laughs> I'll send you it. You just have to promise not to show you. <laughs> okay, deal. <laughs> yeah. So like with like being based in New York then, like how is that as a like as a as an audio narrator as a voice actor, you know, you have to be in a sound treated room, of course, like you know, the the most the the least amount of noise and vibrations and interruptions the better. Like how is that living in in the Big Apple? Challenging. Yeah. Definitely challenging. Um, which actually right now, today, I'm in Connecticut because okay. I have a booth here, which it's a lot quieter. It was a lot easier to do. Yeah. <laughs> um, and that's that's typically where I record my audiobooks. And so I kind of I'm going back and forth a lot. However, mm. I'm about to buy a booth for my apartment. Um Hopefully, like within the next month, I'm going to make my final decision about which one I want. And yeah, yeah. because I feel like Uh, it's such a huge choice. (laughs) Yeah. And like you can get like Um, get like proper booth envy as well. If you see other people's setups and stuff and they have like I think have like lights and and candles and all sorts of stuff in there. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Absolutely. So that makes my decision a lot harder. (laughs) (laughs) Would you be Um, wanting to to decorate your booth? Yeah. I think I would keep it organized, but I would definitely want to customize it in some way. Yeah. Um. So probably a lot of pink, you know, <laughs> <laughs> super girly. <laughs> um. But in terms of especially when I first started doing voiceover work and all of that, and I was doing it from my apartment and it very quickly 
became apparent that, you know, I, I have some panels in my apartment right now, just in case I need to, because sometimes I'll do some of my short form work there. Mm -hmm. And you pick quiet moments and you get it done. But for a long form like this, it just does not work. Mm -hmm. Um, And I think especially doing audiobooks, I've I've gotten such an ear for sound that I would have never otherwise had, mm. um, which is kind of, let's call it a weird side effect that happens <laughs> where it's like the tiniest noise. I'm like, what is that? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it's a bit of a curse, isn't it? Because if you're watching, like, I, I notice it on the news, like, with mouth clicks. Or, like, oh, my or, gosh, Or, or those, yes. like, a, um, ASMR videos that you sometimes see online of people, like, talking really close to that. And I guess that's kind of what people are after, but it drives me nuts because you're just like, that should have been edited. <laughs> should have yes. Been, should have taken that and out. And just because you said that, I just took a sip of water, and I hope everyone heard it. <laughs> <laughs> so we talked, we've spoken about social media and stuff like where is like the best place for people to keep up with you um my instagram or tiktok i would say my instagram mm -hmm. is more um also has the personal content and mm -hmm. all that but both are under my name alexa elmy so i'm i'm easy to find and if you want to follow my play it's alexa play nyc on instagram um, or, you know, I kind of keep my website clean for a while. I was trying to do all of those updates every time I had a new project, but mm -hmm. it just kind of became too much. So yeah. I would say if you want to know more about me professionally, you can look on my website, which is also alexaelmy.com. Again, very easy to find. <laughs> Awesome. Well, I'll make sure that everything's linked front and center uh, in the show notes so folks can check that out. Um, I'd love to, as we as we draw this interview to an end, I'd love to simply end by asking if you have any upcoming projects that you're excited about. Of course, we have a big one of uh, of your play, but just any sort of upcoming audio books, mention the play again, whichever, anything that's, that's uh, upcoming in the diary that we can look forward to. Um, well, so the YA psychological thriller mm -hmm. that I... I just finished narrating um, and submitted it <clears throat> yesterday. Um, that one is called Good Girls Stay Quiet by Joe Cassidy. And it was a really, it's a chilling story, but it's a good one. Hmm. Um, so that I'm, I'll be really excited once that uh, is all, all online and all of that. Yeah. Um, I'm about to record a few projects for Tantor, which I'm excited about. Um, yeah, you know, it's it's funny with audiobooks, it's a new project often every week. So yeah. <laughs> there there isn't necessarily just one that I'm excited about. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. It is tricky because you can't say one and not the other. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Well, they sound fantastic. Uh, this is absolutely fantastic. And what I'll do is I'll make sure that um, all the links to like, recent audiobook projects, um, Audible and all that things are, are in uh, are front and centre um, on the show notes for people to check out. So that kind of brings us to a close for this episode of the Audiobook Club. Um, as I just said, all of the links to Alexa's social media website, recent projects um, will be linked in the show notes. Uh, thank you so much for tuning in. And of course, another huge, huge, huge thank you to you, Alexa, for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. It was so much fun. Frustrated by the royalty rates for your audiobook? Annoyed that when the digital distributors say 70% royalties, they actually mean 70% of 50% or 80% of 70%, neither of which is an actual 70%. Wishing there was a way to cut out the middleman? Yet, you want your audiobook listeners to have a smooth and positive experience, and a direct download sale from your website won't deliver that. We at Pro Audio Voices hear you. Out of our commitment to our author clients, we've created Amplify, a program that provides an actual 65% of the sales price that you set that gives you access to your customers' names and emails so you can reconnect with them and keeps you in the driver's seat. Check it out at ProAudioVoices.com. You'll find Amplify in the marketing menu.